Really? NASCAR actually went and did it. They just handed out massive penalties to all of the non-playoff drivers involved in some sort of race manipulation at the end of Sunday night's Martinsville race. Let's get to the details. This is all coming in in real time. So NASCAR just handed massive penalties to the track house number one, the RCR number three, and the 23-11-23 teams for what went down at Martinsville Sunday night. And wow, these are I would say these are borderline unprecedented. Let's break this down. All three drivers were hit with $100,000 fines, were docked 50 driver owner points. Oh my gosh, and get this, the owners were also fined $100,000 each. So that's $200,000 per team. That's new, right? Have we seen owners directly getting fined for on-track violations? I'm not sure we've seen that. In addition to this, all three teams will have both the crew chief and spotter suspended for this weekend's race at Phoenix Raceway. Wow. Nothing for William Byron. Nothing for Christopher Bell. I saw a report. Someone tweeted that Elton Sawyer said Bell already received his penalty for the wall ride at, at the end of Martinsville's race. So, yeah, I guess that's it. And, wow, I'm already seeing RCR says they will appeal. Uh, 2311 says they will appeal. I imagine Trackhouse will also appeal. So these will be expedited appeals. I'm sure we'll hear about that in the next couple of days ahead of this weekend's at, race at Phoenix. So, man. And the saga just never ends. I was going to say the $100,000 fine, 50-point deduction, suspensions are in line with what they did to Cole Custer and Stuart Haas two years ago. Remember at the Roval, it was a round of 12 cutoff race. The crew chief came over the radio on the last lap and said, hey, we got a tire down. Slow up, slow up. And so Custer did to let his teammate Chase Briscoe gain some positions. NASCAR came down pretty hard on them. Then this seems like an escalation to effectively double the fine. Actually, you know what? I think they still fined Stuart Haas 200K, but it was the driver and the crew chief. They didn't explicitly find the owner back then. So this is still different. I'm not sure if it's an escalation. I guess NASCAR must have found nothing broken on Bubba Wallace's car post race. <laughs> Uh, this is no laughing matter. No, this really is not. I'm seeing all sorts of interesting reports here, quotes. I guess Elton Sawyer is doing a press conference currently. According to Davey Siegel, Elton Sawyer said that they considered penalizing the manufacturers, but there's no mechanism in the rule book to do so. We'll look at that in the off season. Here's a quote from Elton Sawyer. We will meet with drivers and make it clear that when you do anything to compromise the integrity of the sport, we will react. Wow. Honestly, I am surprised they came down this hard on all three teams. Look, I think there was clear race manipulation. I think it was clear the Chevys were trying not to pass William Byron. They formed effectively a blockade. I think it was pretty clear that Bubba Wallace was laying over to let Christopher Bell gain that important position. I do believe everyone committed some sort of act of race manipulation. They all went against the 100% rule that NASCAR has that states competitors must compete at 100% of their ability at all times with the goal of achieving the best possible finishing position. I think they all broke that rule. Pretty clear. But... As I point out this week, there are previous examples of teams breaking that rule and not getting penalized, like Eric Jones being told, do not pass Denny Hamlin. That's a, an important playoff spot. No penalty then. Drivers are told all the time not to help certain guys at super speedway races. So I, I'm a little surprised they came down this hard considering past precedent. But again, as NASCAR is known to do, they've established, I suppose, a new precedent. Is this penalty harsh enough to deter teams from trying similar strategies in the future? I'm not sure. It was mentioned in one of those posts, but this really wasn't a case of team orders. This was manufacturer orders. Ford, Chevy, Toyota, they've got a lot of clout. They spend a lot of money in this sport. They work very closely with these teams. Anyone who has a, a key partner alliance with a manufacturer, they're all effectively teammates. Like Kyle Busch is expected to help out Kyle Larson if Chevy wants him to. Ford, Brad Keselowski is expected to help out Joey Logano if Ford wants him to. Like teams are obviously teams, 
But if you're a key partner team, all of the other key partners within that manufacturer are effectively your teammates as well. We've been talking about this for years, super speedway racing. It's not just how are the Hendrick cars going to work together? No, it's how are the Chevys going to work together? You notice it's not just Hendrick cars pitting under green. It's the entire Chevy fleet pitting at the same time. Toyota, same thing. Talladega. It wasn't just Joe Gibbs or 2311 Toyotas in that pack that crashed each other. It was all three teams represented. So that's really at the core of this. Again, I point out there are three, in my opinion, three reasons why 2311 Trackhouse and RCR attempted to manipulate Martinsville's race. One is the playoff format allows for this kind of situation to come up more frequently. These mini seasons, more cutoff races, more moments where individual points and positions will be scrutinized. The format is part of it. Another part of it, I believe, is that the team's at least up until this moment, didn't really fear NASCAR race control. Like I've mentioned, they've let similar incidents go in the past. NASCAR does not want to make the tough call, especially when it impacts the championship. So that's reason two. But reason three, I pointed out yesterday, and I absolutely believe it to be the case, is that manufacturers have so much pull nowadays, you're no longer dealing with just your teammates. You're expected to look out for all of your Chevy teammates, all of your Ford, all of your Toyota teammates. And so that just creates, again, more opportunities for organizations to try and game the system like this. I don't know how you fix it. NASCAR considering apparently penalizing OEMs in the future. (laughs) I don't know how that would go over. Again, considering how important Ford, Chevy, and Toyota are to the health of stock car racing. But maybe there's a path there. I'm not sure. This is just my immediate reaction. Uh, In tomorrow's episode, I will take a deeper dive into this. We'll look back at some of the more damning radio communication. I do think there was clear manipulation by the one, the three, and the 23 Sunday night. There was nothing on the 24's radio that was especially damning. The 20, there was one quote kind of interesting. We'll go over this tomorrow. There was one quote that concerned me a bit, um, but again, the 20 had already been penalized. 20's already out. You're not going to suddenly put him back in the championship four. So I didn't hear anything on the 24. William Byron, to me, was the most innocent of all of the players in this incident. So I think if they were going to penalize guys, these are the guys you penalize. We can debate if it was too harsh, not harsh enough. Did it really send a message? How does this change the precedent going forward? We can debate that more at a later time. But this is just my initial reaction. Wanted to get it out there. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your night.